Welcome to the end of physics. And what I mean by that is that we can see the light at the end of the tunnel. Because if you recall from the release of the Pretonic Standard Model, that all of the intrinsic properties of matter that ta were talked about in quantum mechanics were eliminated as properties synthesizable by a more primordial system. There was only one intrinsic property that remained, and that was charge. More specifically, it was pretonic charge, not Coulomb charge. And in this video, we're going to eliminate charge, pretonic charge. And after we do that, we're going to have a brief discussion of the status of the Ethereal Mechanics project. And so from the electrogravity series, we demonstrated that matter feeds on ether. Ether is the energy content that matter consumes in order for matter to exist. And matter consumes energy proportional to volume, which is meters cubed per second squared. In the constructs paper, we showed that energy can be defined in terms of natural units, which would be pretonic charge squared meters per second squared. Now, if you multiply this by mu over 4 pi, that converts natural joules to legacy joules, which is kilogram meters squared per second squared. Okay, but we're not using legacy units anymore. We're sticking to the natural units. So joules in natural units is Coulomb squared meters per second squared. Again, that Coulomb is in pretonic Coulombs, not legacy Coulomb. In the electrogravity series, we also showed that when we derive the constant g, the gravity constant, that the radius of a preton and the charge of a preton are related as a constant. And we gave that constant the name kp. This isn't an arbitrary constant, it's just a ratio. But what it basically shows, and what was theorized, is that charge is really just the shape of a preton. And that's what this sh says. And this Kp has the units of meters per coulomb. So if, in fact, charge really just is the shape of a preton, then wherever we have charge, we can replace it with meters. So if we take our definition of energy and we replace charge with meters, we end up with that energy is defined in meters cubed per, coulomb, uh, per second squared, which corroborates that the consumption of ether at this rate is in fact corroborates or correlates with energy. Okay, and this would be the way that we could corroborate that there is no such thing really as charge. It's just the shape of the preton as it plows through the medium and consumes it. Just like the size of Pac-Man's mouth would determine how many things Pac-Man can eat. Okay, so the size of a preton, the shape of a preton, dictates the rate of consumption of the medium. And then we don't really need to have charge anymore. Not that we're going to eliminate charge from the equations, because until we know what the shape of a preton is, we're probably going to hold on to charge for a little bit longer. But now we're very sure now that charge is nothing more than the shape of a preton. And that charge correlates to the radius. Okay, this has two earth-shaking ramifications. One, it's a corroboration of energy and ethereal feeding. So what we define as energy and ethereal feeding is one and the same thing now. It also is the elimination of arbitrary intrinsic properties, at least in matter. Okay, we still have to get rid of intrinsic properties of ether, but we're on track to be doing that. Now let's review the 24th and 34th rules of scientific acquisition. The 24th rule is the arbitrary constant tell. This is actually a derivative of the 17th rule, which is the ambiguity tell. Okay, but it's 24.0. If you know how things work, then nothing should be arbitrary. And 24.1, arbitrary constant relation are placeholders for missing pieces of the puzzle. And so ethereal mechanics has eliminated all arbitrary constants of relation in science. So we've, it's the end of classical physics because we don't have any more arbitrary constants of relation. There may be some other arbitrary constants of relation out there, but they are academic at this point. And because the main ones have been deambiguated, then we can unwrap the other ones as well. Okay, and then the 34th rule of acquisition is the intrinsity tell. 
Basically, intrinsic properties indicate unfinished science. This is actually highly related to the 24th rule of acquisition because it's basically another, another offshoot of the ambiguity tell, which is the 17th rule. And I tried combining them all into smaller and smaller number of rules, but that gets to be too confusing because then you have rules with 27,000 different you know, sub uh, definitions. It's easier to break it out. So we let, I added the new, the 34th rule is a new rule because uh, I really just didn't have the heart to kind of combine it into here. So the intrinsic detail is pretty much the same thing. And Ethereum Mechanics has eliminated all intrinsic properties, at least for matter. We still have intrinsic properties of Ether, but we're on track to eliminating those. And we can see the light at the end of the tunnel, which means that physics is going to be at the end. Because this abstraction layer, like I said, as we move up and do more of the work here and more of the work here, we're going to uncover pieces of the puzzle back in the ethonic layer. And that's what just in fact happened. We're going to be moving that abstraction layer back as we fill in these missing pieces. And we're going to apply the patches uh, as we go forward. So the next thing on the list, now that electrogravity is done and we're moving the abstraction layer back, is we're going to produce new electromagnetism V5. I'm behind schedule on it. So, and what's one of the problems I'm running into is that the electromagnetism V5 is going to be experimentally heavy. There's a lot of experiments that we're going to have to run. Well, I've already run them for my Patreon folks, but we have those are high end experiments. I'm trying to make the experiment simpler so that it can be run by a high school kid with nothing more than an Arduino board. And, and a little daughter board that hopefully they can make. The problem we're running into is that parts are drying up. And let me give you an example here. Uh, one of the ideas was is to, to put a little FPGA on a daughter card that can do all the sampling needed to run, let's say, the induction experiments. Okay, and what's happening is there's 25,000 different types of FPGAs that, that DigiKey carries, but Let's only consider the ones that are actually active, that are not obsolete. That's still 13,000. Now, how many do they have in stock? And now we're down to 808, okay? So parts are like almost non-existent. And the other problem is the other option was to go and uh, let me show you my cart. Instead of using an FPGA, it's just to buy some simple you know, 7400 series logic chips that can sample at that rate. You know, these are 54 cents, a buck each, simple things. But when I'm sitting in my, my parts thing here and doing some other shopping, I came back to find that one of the parts I selected, they ran out of them while I'm sitting there shopping and went on back order. <laughs> so and I've been having that a lot. I've been, you know, setting up shopping carts with stuff that I'm buying. And as I go along, the things dry up. So uh, that is a problem. That's so what I'm trying to do here is I'm trying to come up with options, trying to overbuy parts to make sure we have available options. Because one of the other options is, is not to build a little sampling unit, but in fact to, uh, let's say, you know, have a nice, where is that? There it is. You know, because a 12-bit sampling, a scope to do the sampling would be great, but that's, you know, that's $4,000. And these are running out because uh, this was actually the, the 350 megahertz model they're completely out of, and it's a four, week, four to six week lead time to get them in. So it's very likely when we get to there, this is probably going to be gone. So the next option I'm running, I'm looking at is to, you know, if we can do the engineering, is to be able to use an 8 bit scope, an inexpensive 8 bit scope, three or four hundred dollars, to do the sampling. Okay, but I don't want to invest in another scope right now until I can do the engineering and find out that an 8-bit scope will work. Because an 8-bit scope will work, I have one, and then just have to try to develop it for a less expensive scope, yada, yada, yada. So you can see I'm running into all, the idea here is I want to keep my options open so when we get to the experiments, we have an option that's simpler, and I want to have the parts on hand, and have enough parts on hand that if people want to, you know, for me to develop the, or build when one of the daughter cards, I can send them out and they could recreate the experiments and also try to make it simple enough that they can adapt other things to use to do the experiment. Okay, so I've been spending a lot of time doing that. I've been wasting a lot of time on that. So here's a general outline of where we're going to go with new electromagnetic version 5. Next week, I'm going to produce the introduction video. I'm going to 
scarf a lot from the video I'm going to show you next. And the other thing I've decided is that the only part, the, usually I typically like to release the paper first and have it copyrighted before I produce any videos. But the interesting thing about new electromagnetism V5, most of the stuff has already been released in one form or another. Uh, the only things that are proprietary that I have not released is the two omega effects and the new conduction model, the new magnet model. So what I may do is just start producing the videos for the parts we already have and then producing a small paper just on these, get that copyrighted, and then just produce the videos. And again, Patreon members will see the videos before everybody else does. Because uh, the reason why, if I have to, and I may end up breaking up the paper into smaller parts for that very reason, because the bigger the paper is, the longer it takes to review the paper, the longer it takes to double check all the cost references, yada, yada, yada. So if I break the paper up into smaller bite-sized components, I can release things on a quicker timeline because I'm running out of time. Okay, and the other thing that I've been working on inside is my first jot tirade or my first venture into advertising. And so my first thing, I, I just paused the advertising on this. So in the last three weeks, 64,000 impressions were sent out and I put it on sites like Veritasium and you know, and, and PBS science and things like that that are heavy into people science traffic. Okay, of the 66,000 impressions, only 129 click-throughs. Okay, that's kind of anemic. I need to, I think I need to better video or change the parameters of how it's getting out there. I don't know. Okay, and so the cost was $841. And that gave me per click $6.52 per click. I need to get this down to like a buck or something like that. So I put it on pause and we're going to do some more in the future. But what I'm going to do first, uh, well, okay, let me get to viewer questions. So from the pretonic standard model, we have two questions. One question, how much experimental verification does your pretonic model have? That's kind of an interesting question because uh, I, am, I am matching the experiments that were obtained by classical physics. So if the models get the same answers that the mainstream physics get, then isn't that experimental verification? Or maybe he's asking how many other experimental verification, and that dovetails with the next guy. Hi, Robert. I know as an engineer, you don't sit there and theorize all day. You must have valuable applications developed. And are those applications ready to go? And that is, you know, these are all the experiments that were done for the new electromagnetism V5 trailer. Uh, this was all done before we even went to electrogravity because I wanted to make sure NEV5 was right before I even put pen to paper on the electrogravity. Okay, but the problem is these are high-end experiments with high-end scopes. And again, I want to make these experiments simpler so that like a school kid can run these experiments and try to make like one daughter card that can do multiple of these experiments. That would be very, very cool. Okay, so that's why I'm putting a lot of effort into buying parts in advance if I can make one daughter card for, let's say, an Arduino Uno that can cover all of these experiments, you know, have the stepper motor drivers, the, the current ramp part, and ba -ba -da -ba -ba -da -ba, all that stuff into one little daughter card, then it'd be very easy for people to follow the experiment. And we, maybe we can make some money selling the daughter card. Who the hell knows? Uh, who the heck knows? Uh, to help fund this, this project. So in the next week, um, next weekend, 8 to 9, there'll be, nothing will be published because I want to finish up any of the preemptive ordering of parts and continue the planning for NEV5. And I also need to get my house ready for winter. And I'm going to design three new ad videos. And then the next weekend, I'm going to uh, produce NEV5 introduction video. And I'm going to take a lot from the T21 trailer because the T21 trailer was produced last year before we started electrogravity to tell everybody that new electromagnetism V5 is coming. And I'm going to, there's a lot of video, a lot of stuff in there that we can take to make an intro video for NEV5. Okay, so I'm not going to wait for the paper to get the introduction video out. And then I'm going to post the ads produced here to the Patreon members so they can vote on which one they like the best so that we can start a new ad campaign with hopefully a better video that can draw more people to the site. Okay, um, and then um, we're going to start the NEV5 paper and I'm going to break it up to at least two parts. One is theoretical and the other is going to be experimental. And I probably will have a different paper for each experiment. That way there we break things up into more bite-sized pieces. Okay, again, we're still in the planning phase of this, so this may change. 
Another problem I'm running into is my responsibilities at my J-O-B are increasing. Again, my salary is still the main source of funding for this project. Um, and that, and that, so therefore, that's going to become my priority. So I may have to slow down production for a while as I am working out the higher responsibilities for my J-O-B or until we can get traffic to the site large enough that I could quit my J-O-B. Now, here's my begging and pleading portion. I'm going to make this a little different from previous. So how can you help? Obviously, you can become a Patreon member. Or there's another thing you do. Help me get the word out. I mean, if you just look at, you know, Veritasium, okay, Derek produces a video, and in one day, he's got 1.6 million views. Okay, imagine if you go online to YouTube and you see that Derek puts a new video out that's only 10 minutes old. Go in there, put a comment that's related to his video with a link to one of my videos and say, hey, you know, just since he's already figured out this falling objects thing, if there's a related video for that. Because your comment is going to be seen by some of these 1.6 million views over the next day. And that could help us out tremendously. So if you go online and you catch one of these and catch it really early, like, you know, been released 10 or 15 minutes ago, then get me a comment on there. That's what I'm trying to do with the advertising. I'm trying to target, you know, people with a little ad that they have to see on, on Derek's video, you know, before it gets going. With a, But I got five seconds to catch their attention. Okay, and if you can get me a comment in there, that can only help us out. So I'd appreciate if you could at least do that. Well, that ends uh, my begging and pleading for this video. I hope you like where we're going. And I thank you all for your support. And um, we'll see you in two weeks. Thank you.